Oh, okay. So 
VNL, the mean of the analysis that we do are these decay curves where we are keeping the wavelength fixed but varying the distance and thus essentially varying the time. Um, it's important to note that I got this data essentially on Friday, so I didn't have time to do the, um, a multi-exponential, which is important for these because the upper level of the transitions will have other transitions transitioning into it, so it will be an exponential sum rather than just a single exponential. And um, the literature seems to indicate that there may be significant cascades associated with this particular transition. So the single exponential plot that I've done is particularly inaccurate and should be regarded mostly as, say, a preliminary look, uh, an idea of what we might be looking for, this, uh, this time constant of 0.78 plus or minus 2, 3. That will um, almost de definitely change once we actually get a good multi-exponential fit. But I will talk about that later. All right, so because the data has just started coming in very recently, I spent most of my time doing computations using this GRASP 2K software, which what it does is it, sol it iteratively solves the Dirac equation to create um, wave functions for all of the electrons in an atom that you specified. And I used that to find the energy levels of the states that I was interested in. And then from those energy levels, I was able to compute the transition probabilities in the form of F values. Um, the unique thing about the grasp 2 k software is that it attempts to compensate for some of the relativistic effects. A lot of the most common algorithms used for these wave function generating are often hartree fock which are not rel relativistic. And once you get to larger atoms, relativistic effects are really quite important. So what GRASP uses is this Dirac hartree fock which um, attempts to compensate for some of these relativistic effects, even though it's not completely relativistic. And I'll talk about that later. So the first thing I had to do was define these energy levels. And this is a plot from the NIST website. So this is all experimental levels. And the first thing you, you will notice is that it's all relative to the ground state. The, the ground state is defined as zero. This in particular is tin to, um, simply so ionized tin. So the ground state is defined as zero because it's a lot easier and more convenient to define everything as relative rather than trying to find actually the definite energies. Also you notice that the levels are defined in inverse centimeters rather than some form of energy. And the reason for that is if you take the inverse of these levels, you get the wavelength of what would, if it would transition to ground. So that's very convenient. Um, but another thing to notice is that the only quantitative attributes here in this table are the J and the level. These configurations and terms are good approximations most of the time, but once you start adding in the relativistic effects, they start getting cast into more doubt and we're not sure exactly if it is exactly, in this case, say a 5s5 p2 orbital, you see that there are some question marks here. And that's because this is just it's essentially a model that doesn't fit quite perfectly because of relativity. Um, so then I had to actually compute these energy levels. And as I said, GRASP um, compensates for a lot of the relativistic effects, though there are some that I didn't include um, due to lack of time and such, like bright interaction. I can talk about that later as well. And But one of the key things that I was attempting to compensate for was this configuration mixing. Because, as I said, some of the levels are called into question, and it's because of this configuration mixing. We might say that it's a 5s squared 5p orbital, but due to quantum superpositions, it might be spending time in other places. It might be um, 5s 5p squared, sometimes 5s squared 5d, things like that. So, if you want to get the wave function of a particular electron, you can't just have a single orbital. You will have the wave functions of a lot of different orbitals, and you will have mixing coefficients um, involved with them when you're summing it together. So the larger the mixing coefficient is, the uh, more time that an electron is spending in that particular orbital, say. And here you can see the plot that I have made of the theoretical calculations. I am with each iteration, I'm increasing the number of orbitals I'm allowing to be considered as these substitutions in this configuration mixing. And as you can see, um, this very last 
column are the NIST values, so the experimental values, what should be considered essentially the correct values. You see, as I increase the number of ordinals I'm allowing the substitutions into, the um, values for these levels are um, approaching, are getting closer to the correct values, though you see they are plateauing as we get into higher energies and much, and places where it's much less likely to be. So I ended up using this n equals 10 level for my energy approximations because I figured that was the best I was going to get in the time I had allotted. And now we get to the actual transition probabilities. Ooh. So I looked around in the literature and I found some values for the f values of these particular transitions, which are from the final squared success state down into the ground state, the two um, different J values for the ground state. And here you can see the F values that I calculated in comparison to the ones that this other person calculated. And it's important to note that they, these are theoretical values and not necessarily experimental. So if the theory has flaws, it could be that we're, we are both off. But it's nice to see that they are um, similar, at least. And then this is just a quick table of um, the the transition probabilities I calculated from these particular low-lying upper levels down into the um, ground state with j equals one half. And so the next thing to do, of course, is to the, convert the um, time constants we find from experimental values and try and convert those into f values so we can see uh, if we can find what level they are and if f values compare to theoretical predictions. All right, don't have much time for the slide, but future work using this, um, one thing we need to do to do the multi-exponentials is to use this ANDC analysis, arbitrary normalized decay curve, and that's a way of fitting these multi-exponentials that works um, better than just, you know, guesswork. And it's a, you have to essentially solve this differential equation where the, um, IF is the intensity of the transition of the light given off by the transition that you're interested in. And these IJIs are the intensities of light that are from the, all the cascades coming into your upper level. And then this is a, um, just a coefficient based on, say, Einstein A coefficients as well as um, some other things. And so the key is to solve this differential equation, and I don't know how to do that, but this is the theoretical idea of how we would approach that. And the other thing that I'd like to do is try and refine the energy levels further. As you recall, there were some significant um, discrepancies between the, my best theoretical values and the actual experimental values recorded in NIST. So hopefully, including some of these other relativistic effects would improve that. All right. Questions? Yes. So GRASP calculates the energy levels and the transition probabilities. Yes. And uh, I assume it takes some time. And how much of the, uh, of the proportion of the time does it take to calculate the energy levels? And how much does it take to calculate the transition probabilities after that? Um, the energy levels definitely take the most time. Actually, if, if we go back here to this slide, um, it really depends on how many configurations you're including. Because with these n equals 5, these are the, the sort of energies that I'm allowing. So up to the, the n equals 5 is like up to 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f, 5g. And then n equals 10, that's 10s, 10p, etc. So um, this, this calculation took hours. And I attempted to do n equals 11, and it took over a day, and then decided that it was probably a continuing state, so I just left that out. Um, whereas doing it with no excitations takes very little time. But when I ran the transition, the transition probability um, portion of the software for n equals 10, it took a significantly smaller amount of time than calculating all the energy levels, because it had to take into account all of these different substitutions that it where it could possibly be. Yes? So at the end, you mentioned some additional effects. I can't a little transverse photon or something. Uh, yes. Um, um, actually, yeah, so it can grasp or yes. handle all those? Yes, there's a program called RCI with
within GRASP where you can choose to uh, include or not include these different um, these different relativistic corrections, which I believe it does by altering the, the Hamiltonian that it uses. Um, but I don't have the theoretical backgrounds to know which is you know most important or not, so I didn't use it. Also, I noticed that when I did these RCI calculations, just you know trying a few things like the first few, like I, I did transverse photon, I believe. It, I noticed that it tended to lower the energy levels, which is not exactly what I want to, to be happening. But um, it's possible that I'm, you know, I, I don't have the theoretical background to know exactly what I should be applying, what's most important for you know, atoms of the size that I'm looking at. So um, with more time learning more of the theory, I think it would be possible to improve on these energy states. Yes? How many different ionization stages can you produce with this for, for tin? Can you produce with this foil technique? And what is the special interest in, in uh, tin 2? Um, the reason that we chose to do tin 2 is because we recently had a paper published on lead 2. And um, if you look in the periodic table, lead is um, directly beneath tin. So we wanted to look at tin mostly because it's just going up one level on the periodic table, so we think it should be similar to lead. And as far as the um, ionizations, which you can get, I believe it can, it creates a lot of different ionizations. Um, I'm not, I'm, and so we have to select for the one that we're looking for those specific wavelengths and make sure we're looking at something that's definitely singly ionized tin and not something else. We can probably at most get to doubly ionized. This depends on, on your energy. Yeah. yeah. Yes? How many electrons are there in your calculation? Um, I believe tin is uh, as 50 or so. Uh, at least the well, if it's singly ionized, it might be 49. Okay. So, <laughs> yes. Not as many as lead. I'm lucky that I didn't have to try and do the of that. That would have taken a much longer time. The computation of the energy levels kept doesn't um, deal with all of those, right? When you have the cores inside yes. there. I did, I did set a core, which was all of um, up to n equals 4. Was, was the core, and I was just varying the, um, um, essentially, the three valence electrons. So, 5 s squared by the feet in the ground state. And it still took quite a while. But the relativistic effects are still active in the core. I mean, you still have to have relativistic refractive wave electrons for the core electrons. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm just curious, um, <coughs> you say anything about the, maybe you haven't done it. Did all this much answer? How, how do these calculations scale with the number of electrons? Like what power of the number of electrons? That's an interesting question. Yeah. I should know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you should. <laughs> Scales a lot in computational effort. Definitely does. That's, that's what you meant. Yeah, is that what you meant? Yes. <coughs> what was lead taking at, uh, Dave, roughly when you're the longest one? Well, uh, one day just because yeah. I sort of ran out of patience then. Right, right. <laughs> right. But that was not up to, uh, I didn't have as many uh, orbitals as she had. It didn't take as long as the, uh, For me, it was n equals 11, it just didn't work. <laughs> Can the computation be made parallel? Yeah. Yes. They have parallel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't do anything with the MPI, but yes, it has the functionality to do that. All right. Let's thank Kendra again.